ideas birthed by a child's stolen glances at historic texts in the palaces of Rome had now brought the wars of the British Isles to an end. It was a state that not even those who lived before the Roman invasion could have imagined, and it was all down to the equally hard to imagine courage of Constantinus and his followers. His success strengthened the loyalty of these followers, and the outrage of his opponents. After all, he had demonstrated that he had the vision and leadership not just to protect but to conquer, a skill lost to Rome over the decades, but he had used it for his own gain while Rome itself crumbled. Gaul had been overrun by Germanic tribes, creating a barrier between Britannia and their former protectors. It was no concern of Constantinus, for it was clear that the barbarians of mainland Europe would rather plunder the weakened empire than his island fortress. Instead, he turned his attention to internal matters. The most pressing to him was the matter of religion. His territories were rapidly accepting the Roman pantheon as their new gods, spurred on by the apparent proof of their power in the success of their favoured leaders. Festivals were rebranded, shrines rededicated, and Roman customs became mandatory for those in high society, no matter how far back their Celtic lineage went. The people of the newly occupied territories were happy to learn that Roman law was not the bastion of idiocy their previous leaders had insisted it was. In fact, most found their rights and opportunities expanded under Constantinus, not to mention the prospect of the centuries of tribal raiding and warring coming to an end. But it was true that Britannia was not an island accustomed to peace. It was brimming with warriors who were about to be left without a calling. Constantinus knew it well, for he also felt somewhere deep inside him the guilty dread of peace. He knew that Rome had been built to greatness upon martial prowess and was eager to avoid the creation of a peaceful noble caste in the fashion of the falling empire. Most of all, it was his son Constans that he wished to uplift into military fame. Retiring suddenly from his command of the main army, he appointed Constans as his replacement. He reasoned that the only way to guarantee his line of succession be set off in the fashion he wished was for his family to have as much control over the troops as possible, and that meant making troops loyal to his sons as generals, not to the senate that provided them with pay. The troops he would be relying on were yet to be mustered. A project to reform the Britannian military yet again was set underway, requiring huge amounts of manpower, materials, logistical acumen and experimentation with equipment designs. Of the countless restless warriors of the land, the best were sought out and gathered at Oboricum. Given a heavy tower shield, covered in layered chainmail and handed a short, nimble sword, these men were a relic from Rome's greater days, forged not from Romans, but from Britons, Picts, Abdanians and Caledonians, people who could all call themselves Britannian beneath the Golden Eagle standards of the Legion. Trained for fitness, discipline, tactical depth and rapid deployment, these Britannian legionaries were the finest soldiers the islands could ever hope to produce, and were perhaps the most deadly force the world had seen in a long time. But they were in the hands of Constance, a man for whom war was just a board game in which the prize was freedom to do as he pleased and the penalties were beyond consideration. In the hands of an experienced commander, such as Tullus or Constantinus himself, the new legions could have marched to the end of the world. But Constans, it had been decided, had to be the one to profit from their skill, lest there be no argument to the Senate that the imperial consul should be a hereditary position, as Constantinus was demanding. Julianus, his second son, remained as overlooked as ever, despite demonstrating an outstanding reputation for winning the favour of the people during his governorship over Caledonia and Abernia. And so, years after the last rebel had surrendered to Tullus, ships were gathered at Camaldunum and Iblana for a military expedition. The Caledonian people had already began raiding mainland Europe, and had found the remnants of the Roman Empire as easy to pick at as the sudden rise of the Alamans would suggest. Hoping to gain experience and glory for his son and his legionaries, Constantinus ordered Constans to take his men to Iberia to aid the Caledonian raiding forces. He bargained with the Senate that Tullus go also to oversee the campaign and represent the interests of the faction of senators opposed to Constantinus's dictatorship, a minority but influential and wealthy enough to be pandered to. 
leaving almost no warriors in Britannia itself, the armies of the new island state set sail for the world at large, hoping to return with riches and tales of valour in the sight of all the gods. But Constance intended to return with a whole lot more than just that. Hello and welcome back to Fields of Mars, where we're going to be moving away from Britannia and checking in with events in northern Iberia, where Constans and Tullus have been sent by Constantinus to support Caledonian raiding efforts against the falling empire, taking anything they can before others do. They've also been tasked first of all with going to visit Hispania, the separatist faction in the region, similar to his own one. But Constans has another idea. He's going to go straight into battle, ignoring Tullus as he moves west west on the original path to come and attack one of the empire's coastal towns. We have a large advantage on the balance bar, though much of that seems to fade away once the battle actually begins. So Constance is eager both to finally get himself a major battle and a major victory under his belt and to see how great the legionaries really are. So they're moving in to assault the town. He's staying back with our archers and lighter troops to support. We've got cavalry on a little hinge between our two wings. Here's the other wing coming in from the south. Also mostly just these legionaries with their tall shields, heavy armor, elite training. These guys are extremely good melee combatants, although since we're doing a town assault, they are going to have to deal with a number of ranged threats. They are trained in doing the mobile testudo, but Constance has given them quite clear orders. They're simply to assault the town as quickly as possible. So they just charge in the enemy's archers on the border, not going to be able to do much. They advance cavalry to defend statically as we try and get into the town, which was a poor move. Some of them are cut down by the peeler that the legionaries throw before joining battle. And now a melee fight will begin where the cavalry's inferior melee stats will eventually cause them to lose. They have a bit more success with their cavalry against our main attack from the east where they do get an actual charge out onto the oncoming legionaries, although it was an uphill charge and the legionaries have pretty high defensive stats so they can just resist this charge and now get the melee going. The enemy's own legionaries, the Elegio Comitatensis, are coming in as well. A far inferior breed of soldier who will struggle in this melee, especially because they even have a numerical disadvantage. The main thing working in the enemy's favour are their towers. Those heavy tower bots ignore the fighting skill and discipline of the legionaries and still just cut them down in one hit. And on both attacks, we are fighting beneath the towers, which is not good for our men whatsoever. Here you can see I'm trying to adjust this unit's position so it starts capturing one of the towers so we can destroy it. But you can and also see how every single shot this tower is firing is killing one of my men. Those massive shields do nothing against the tower's bolts. They go right through and simply kill our troops. While they are positioned there, they are going to be able to throw Pila into the back of the enemy's cavalry there, which are defending against our main thrust. We need to just push through and start moving because staying still whilst under tower fire is not helpful at all. Enemy coming back from routing there, hopeless, sending in a handful of cav against hundreds of legionaries, not going to do anything. On the other side, it's kind of the same thing. We're just defeating all of these cavalry units, which are for some reason being used to statically defend their positions. I guess they just don't have the infantry to defend properly. And there goes one of their officers. The only problem is that tower it's really inflicted some serious damage we've easily lost here a full unit's worth of troops fighting beneath it and there's another problem the enemy had lots of ships out at sea which are now starting to join the battle and they had four siege ships which are firing onages into our ranks and the legionaries with their nice tightly packed formations are a really good target for siege weapons so this unit out on the flanks waiting for an opportunity to advance once the enemy have been pushed out of the way are taking a pounding from that fire. Eventually we get things moving once again and can start rushing towards the centre of the town. The legionary cavalry having already started that battle, those guys even superior to the Equites or Cilia we've been fielding recently. The guys attacking from the south actually couldn't really get to the centre because of the enemy's blockade. I thought it would be faster to go around than to break it down. So there's going to be some delay before they arrive. And here's Constance and his men 
and he has managed to get them into battle fighting against the survivors of some of the enemy's infantry so he can gain a little glory in a very safe way, make sure he is going to win as his other troops push on forwards. Now the enemy landed a good number of their marines and those guys now came in to stop us from advancing some of our troops but this was quite nice in its own way because it actually made this melee happen just in the shadow of this building to the left there which means the enemy's artillery can't see the bulk of my infantry while that fight's going so we didn't take too much damage from that ranged fire anymore which is great. They were just about able to poke at us from the edge, but overall the enemy are obviously not going to be able to resist that attack and they start to fall back, but more and more infantry units, tiny ones, just kept pouring in to try and stop us getting through there. We've captured the centre of the town though, so now these little battles with the marines uh, towards the edge aren't going to be very significant, we just need to finish them off. My rear attack on the enemy gets rear attack itself there, luckily the legionaries are disciplined with high morale so they don't even care about being a rear attack, they will just turn around and engage the enemy and you can see our troops surging forwards as the enemy start to rout we're about to finish them off although we do need to do something about those siege ships because unless they land they are going to still count as active units so we'll need to get rid of them to win the battle and what i'm doing is using all of my lighter troops who didn't really take part in the town assault since we were just rushing it They've come out onto the beach to start using missile attacks against the ships, which were right up against the coast and easy to attack from the land. So first I fired a volley of arrows into this siege crew. They didn't really seem to mind, not even really reacting when they get directly hit by the arrow, so clearly that wasn't going to be a very quick way to deal with this. And at this point they've actually used up all of their ammunition for the most part, so they actually start just sailing away because there's nothing else for them to do in this fight, and those fire arrows are going to be seeing them off. Really, all we need to do now is wait for them to realise what's going on in the main fight and they'll probably just chain rounds due to army losses in the centre of the town. A few survivors being finished off by the huge groups of legionaries who have proven pretty powerful in this first attack. The Caledonian Warlords backing them up there from behind. So a decisive victory for Constant in his first engagement, but a rather messy one. The rush tactics meant that a lot of his legionaries were damaged by the enemy's ranged fire, particularly from those towers. So we'll take a look at the results here. You can can see a couple of units really damaged by that probably lost a couple of units worth of troops in total and we don't have a way to replenish those troops out here either so we'll just have to deal with that but with the battle won, the town is at his mercy, so he will sack it, taking all the wealth he can and gaining experience for himself and his troops. So with that done, the next consideration was should we just sack even more Roman territory? Unfortunately, the next town over was much more heavily defended with a huge garrison, so even Constance doesn't feel like throwing his men away. He will now sneak back to fall back in line with Tullus and continue on their original objective. That wasn't the Consul's instruction, but it was his intention. How do you know? What do you think that you should know my father's will above I? Because by the grace of whatever beings you care to invoke, this campaign is not about him. The instruction was to offer surrender in all cases. It's not these people's fault they're stuck in a corrupt empire. And it's not my fault that I'm stuck with you. You are here to support me and my army. I'll tell you when I want your opinion. For now, I'm quite content with our enemies trembling in fear and my pockets laden with gold. So now that we're back on mission, what we need to do is head east through this mountain pass towards the territory controlled by Hispania. Not going to go all the way in right now, both to avoid trespassing and because we need to avoid any winter attrition here, even this far south. So we'll just set up and Constance and Talos can send diplomats to go and work out a deal with Hispania. While we wait, we can see the main fleet, which was meant to go back to Britannia after delivering our armies, but actually now is going on a mission for Constance. The orders in Involves sneaking around into the Mediterranean, so that's what they're doing at the moment. Back at home, it seems the Caledonian is not satisfied with having one of their nobles marry to Constantinus. He's trying to get a marriage with Julianus, who's ruling back there with Constantinus. But we're going to be turning that down. We need someone better for Julianus. In the next turn, the Empire has sent a priest to preach doom to Tullus and his men. Luckily, they are faithful enough to realise that doom is not going to be coming upon them, although perhaps they were slightly swayed by the arguments, especially Tullus himself, who is no pagan, although not a particularly strong Christian either. But with the turn now complete, we have the option of moving into Hispania, and Constant is of course simply going to do this the straightforward way. He is going to march and put an army right outside 
inside their town in order to strengthen his negotiating position. But Hispania actually does have a full stack of its own inside the town, so maybe that's not going to work as he had intended. So apparently, since they were not intimidated by his moves, he's going to do the next best thing that he knows. He's simply going to lay siege to their city instead. That, of course, involves declaring war on Hispania, which is outside of his mandate completely. And they are allies to the Alamans who control Gaul, so suddenly he's putting Britannia in danger with this move, but he's going ahead anyway. Hispania has a big army of Comitatensis spears, as it turns out, so not very varied, just large in numbers. They've got some cohort, more spears, and probably some cavalry coming in with their garrison as well. The balance bar coming up as vaguely even, probably would have been in our favor if the legionaries weren't already damaged from that previous fight. Talus can come up to join the fight too, pursuing Constans as he goes off on this reckless attack to try and keep him alive, as is his mission. Now the Alamans, suddenly at war with us, decide to make some sort of move towards us, although I'm not 100% sure what the plan was. They seem to send a couple of ships to consider attacking us at Cameldonum, but they actually don't do anything there, so no idea what the plan was, and it doesn't do anything in the end. But the ships do stay around, and we can take that as an opportunity to actually trap them in there, because Theodosius, who is heading back from delivering the troops in Iberia, arrives just in time to actually block the Alamans' route back to their home port. So now he can pick up some mercenary ships and we've got them trapped here. So now we can guarantee that there's not going to be any antics and make it harder for them to go back and ferry troops into Britannia. So that might actually work out okay. But before any of that, Constans is not going to wait around any longer. Even his siege has not convinced Hispania to join our side. So there's only one thing for it. We'll have to simply defeat them and force them into subjugation. So Constans will now lead his men in an attack with Tullus coming in as reinforcements. He's attacking from the east and south, Tullus coming from the west. You can see I'd initially set up my men in a Testudo, ready to advance against the enemy's town and start making a way in with minimal casualties but the enemy have other ideas their commander leads their army out of the eastern part of the city right towards us they're simply going to charge out and attack one of our groups which is actually a pretty good idea because the rest of our army scattered across the rest of the battlefield won't be able to arrive in time to do anything about it especially Tullus's force which is right on the other side of the map even bringing in those onagers, which are now not going to be helpful at all. Was expecting to get a lot of use out of the onagers in this siege assault. So the enemy are clearly forming up for a fight on the eastern part of the map, so we need to get ready for it. First attacking with archers, a good idea because we have a skirmish line out in front. But our skirmish line isn't going to move forward to engage with them because I want them to focus on attacking the enemy's heavy infantry with the javelin. So that's what we're doing now. Those common defensive spears taking a pounding. They're even going to come in and actually fight in melee with my guys. These are heavy skirmishers who are okay in melee and Constance is going to try and take the edge off the enemy's assault by having them fight as the battle gets started. The group coming in from the south is attacked by a single unit of cavalry. That's not going to do very much at all, especially because we do have some spear cohorts there who can go in and fight them. Those bushes obscuring what's actually happening, but I can assure you we will be able to defeat those cavalry. Now, the plan to stop the enemy's assault with our skirmishes went very badly, as you might expect, but a lot more so because of a classic Attila mistake that I made. I forgot that your men will just throw their missile weapons into your own troops if they don't have line of sight on the enemy so all of the legionaries actually killed all of the skirmishers in front of them by trying to throw into the melees and mostly hitting our own side so that was quite a disaster that went a lot worse than I expected the enemy's cavalry attack is coming in here on our right flank again not going to do much because cavalry attacking the legionaries doesn't really help them out especially because it's not even really a rear attack it's the infantry fight where this battle is going to be decided the enemy have absolutely tons of infantry who are now going to be held up fighting with all of our legionaries Generis. So luckily the enemy are queuing up rather than outflanking us with their numerical advantage. That's the perfect situation. We can use our superior melee stats on the front to gradually grind through the enemy's troops. So it just becomes a question of will the enemy have enough troops to gradually damage us back and actually still win in the end. They do also have some missile support, especially they've got hurlers in the centre of their formation there, which are pretty good against armoured units. And Constance himself in danger at the back there. He's forming up in a testudo to defend against those attacks. We've got one unit of spears going around the right flank, which sees off some enemy cavalry. So we'll be able to do some rear attack action with those guys, which will be quite nice. Now, the attack coming from the other 
further direction. It was mostly split off now to go and help out on the east, but I decided to send one unit to continue going to take the town, to take down towers and capture the uh, central point, but it's taking decent casualties from those towers, even in Mobile Test Judo, which is not nice. Now back over at the fight, my cavalry are now going to start getting in on the action. The enemy has a nice soft center with all those hurlers and archers, so once the enemy engaged all their infantry on the front lines into those big QE blobs, those cavalry can have a nice time, but there's just so many of these infantry units that it's starting to get pretty difficult. There's like somewhere near 10 units fighting this one unit of legionaries, and they're being fought from both sides as well, with spearmen coming at them from the front, and some cohort have actually snuck around behind for a rear attack as well. So luckily our guys are really good. Any other unit probably would have been destroyed at this point, so they're holding on, but they're not going to hold on much longer. In the center, things going a little bit better, a much more standard formation, but our men starting to take attrition to the gradual grind of the enemy's forces on the right where the enemy didn't have so many units things going better we're going to surround and destroy one of the enemy units here so we can move these units in to hopefully support the center at least a little bit although they are going to be taking damage from missile fire our own missile units finally arrived they were all with the southern attack groups and now that they're here they're going to rain arrows into the huge blob of enemies you can't really see the arrows and because in Attila archers aren't very powerful it won't really have any noticeable effect but it might gradually reduce their health over time with sustained bombardment so in the center, things getting a little bit dodgy as the enemy are actually reducing our numbers at last. One guy did a 360 kill there, very showy offy. And we actually lost our cavalry somewhere in the infinite sea of enemy spearmen too. So rear attack's getting harder now. Luckily some of Tullus's calf can come in to help, but a little bit too late as the enemy is starting to break through our infantry now. We freed up around five or six of the enemy's infantry units by losing that unit of Legio. So now those guys will advance forward one unit attacking some of our struggling Miarii skirmishers. They are supported by these war dogs who've arrived from one of the other groups, but not going to help. They are defeated, so the enemy could now rear attack our center. That center is still under a lot of pressure, and now even Constance is forced into the fight as the enemy start outflanking his unit. He's supported by legionaries, but he himself going to be in great danger in this open open melee. The horns were blaring, but in the driving rain it was almost drowned out, and what noise was left echoed without direction in the city's streets. But I knew it was the horn Constance had arranged as a rallying order. As predicted, he was in trouble. Knowing that he was likely to lead from the back, I knew at once that our troops were in even more peril, yet they were not afforded the right to call for aid. We rushed down slippery roads and past buildings lined with petrified onlookers, happy to endure the rain that they might see how their husbands, fathers and brothers fared in battle. Were it not for me, perhaps they would have returned in victory. But I turned my eyes from them, raised my voice to a boom, and commanded the slaughter of the exposed enemy we had finally found. Brian continues just a little longer with Constance in ever-increasing trouble. He's lost more than half of his unit now. He's fighting on the front line himself. Luckily, he's been trained by Britannia's finest, including his father, Constantinus, an able warrior himself. So he's not too bad in melee combat, but he's going to need help because his unit aren't particularly powerful. Fortunately for him and for the survivors of the rest of his army, Tullus and his troops finally arrive to take part in the fight. The cohort auxilia coming in for rear attacks, throwing javelins, into the backs of the enemy units, reducing their morale and numbers. And once the melees are joined, the enemy's morale is going to start breaking. We see routes which saves Constance, and now will attack this large bulk of the enemy's troops, fighting with just a handful of our surviving legionaries there, barely anything holding back that huge horde of enemy troops. But the arrival of all these fresh reinforcements has got the enemy spooked. Their general is killed out on one of the flanks, and now the rest of the enemy army is going to chain route to those massive groups Groups of enemy spearmen will now be hunted down by our troops, especially with the arrival of some of the cavalry who will be able to have a great time against them. It's a close victory in the end. Constans losing a massive number of his very valuable troops, but this victory does allow us to finally get troops back because we're going to be able to use this win to subjugate Hispania and make it a puppet state. 
First, let's take a look at the actual results. Two units lost for Konstanz, the rest of the army in bad condition. The archers and the war dogs, who didn't take a massive part in the battle, getting away with it, though. Fatalis thinks, okay, only one unit of damaged cavalry to really worry about. And on the enemy side, everything gone, as all the surrendered troops are knocked out of the fight as well. So we will be subjugating Hispania, which immediately gives us some replenishment to our own troops. And now the fact that Hispania is our puppet state means we will continue to replenish troops while in their territory. Interestingly, the general of the new Hispanian army looks exactly the same as Constanz. I wonder if he hand-picked him, thinking that obviously someone with this appearance is destined for greatness. Uh, the faction leader luckily wasn't that guy, because I think that would have been a little bit strange to have to deal with a guy who's basically Constanz's twin. But anyway, you can see here the replenishment is now happening, so we'll get our troops back. The fact we lost a whole unit of legionaries is unfortunate, because we can't replenish it anymore. But still, we'll do what we can to get these troops back and continue on our mission, or Constance's mission, or really. We should now that we've actually secured the loyalty of Espana, go and continue on seeing what the Caledonians are up to and supporting them on their raiding efforts, making sure the Empire troops don't take them out. But Constance, of course, at this stage, is simply going to follow his own plan. We're going to just ignore the Caledonians and continue moving to the east, and we'll see why in a second. First, jumping back to that situation with the Alamans, their ships just disappeared off into the fog of war so I disbanded the mercenary fleet and we're just going to wait to see if they ever do anything we'll just have to be careful you can see Constantinus there has got a small army to move around in the defense of Britannia and the garrisons are now pretty strong throughout the nation as a result of our military upgrades and the town upgrades so what we're going to be doing is first moving our fleet to scout out the eastern cities on the coast of Iberia this fleet by the way is led by by Ambrosius Aurelianus, another son of Constantinus, his third son. Hasn't done anything of note in the campaign so far, but as the leader of this fleet, he might find some glory thanks to Constans's plans. So I'm scouting out these cities just to see which one has the smallest garrison and will be easiest to tank, because I want Constans and Tullus to come and put themselves to sea in the Mediterranean, but to do that, I need to secure a landing point and in eastern Iberia these landing points are in the zones of controls of enemy settlements so basically we need to win a battle at the settlement before we can put to sea so that's why I'm checking these things to see which one will be the easiest one Narbo to the north despite being smaller than Tarago which we just passed is way more heavily defended so we are going to be heading south first to try and win a battle at the walled settlement of Tarago and from then on we should be free to move out they've only got a couple of units in there so our forces will be able to overwhelm them. So having spent a couple of turns replenishing, our armies are now in a much better state than they were before. So all we need to do is lay siege to Tarako, and you can see with just Constans, we have a gigantic advantage against the couple of units inside. He's going to start building siege equipment there to storm in and take out those few units. Plus, he can call on Tullus to follow him, and Tullus doesn't have much choice, doesn't want to be left alone with only that small army at the very least. So he'll come up to support the attack. And as well as Tullus, we can even get Aurelianus in to take part in the fight with his fleet. He can start a naval blockade if I can ever find the point you have to click on to actually do it. And with that, although the balance bar doesn't really seem to change all that much, our advantage is being multiplied greatly. We can even notice here that the enemy are suffering from some kind of illness inside the town, so their ability to resist us is even further reduced. We'll soon be out to sea, and then we'll see what Constance does from there. It was a long-forgotten sight for the Roman world, the square shields and golden decorations of a fully equipped army of legionaries. They had been set loose on any that their leader Constans saw fit to battle. Whether this was Constantinus's intention is unclear, for while he did not order or sanction starting wars without his consent, he did little to curtail it. If he knew about what Constans was doing, then we can be sure that he privately hoped some good would come of it for Britannia enough good to placate the shouts of the senators rallying against him now that his armies were far from reach. If that were not possible, then perhaps the senate would play their trump card, to have Tullus bring Constance's ambitions to an end. Thanks for watching, we'll see Constance giving the Mediterranean a taste of what it was like in the good old days next time on Fields of Mars.